So what did we evolve specifically to provide the nurture that babies need, but actually we all need throughout life? We have identified nine components of the evolved nest, the communal evolved nest. We evolved to be very cooperative, very social, but we need the right supports to maintain it. It is over 75 million years old, many of these characteristics, common all over the world in our ancestral uh, ways of being. And it's a companionship attachment, which is a little more than what we usually think about as attachment. So caregivers are co-constructing the emotions, the cognitions of the child. They're intertwined in the brain. How the self grows to be what they think of the world, what they think of self. Am I good? Am I bad? Am I uh, safe? And then their worldview of what the world is like. So let's go through each very quickly. The welcoming social climate. For babies, this is a quote I think that's very helpful to understand. The feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is his feeling of rightness or essential goodness. And babies should be in arms all the time. The premise that he is right, good, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence, a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. So babies especially need that, so the brain is growing in the healthy direction. But throughout life, we need this. We need to feel welcome, like we matter, like we have something to offer, that we belong. So we need routines of togetherness, no forced isolation, friendships with multiple aged others, and our sense of belonging we need to maintain. The second component, going very quickly here, is support and scaffolding in the perinatal period. This means that mother, when she's pregnant, feels supported by the community, gestation, uh, during gestation, she has good nutrition, avoids toxins. The baby decides their birthday. Babies vary by about 55 days how long they want to stay in the womb. And, you know, some grow faster than others, so there's a variety. Birth follows the natural rhythms of child and mother without drugs. Now, this is the ideal. So I'm telling you the ideal here of what um, our heritage is. And there's dyadic support. The mother and child are not um, introduced to fearful procedures, fearful stories, controlling stories. No, the mother can follow her, the rhythms of her body, the rhythms of the baby's body, and take their time, uh, ideally, uh, in the birthing process. So she follows her animal instincts, and the hormones in baby and mother help them get through it without too much pain. The child stays with the mother after birth, no separation. They relax into deep bonding. They're able to breastfeed, help, assistance. No painful procedures after birth. And they lay in. They're waited on for weeks afterwards so they can bond and breastfeed successfully. That's our heritage. I know it's very hard to find uh, in many countries today. Third, multiple bonded nurturers. This is safe, stable, reliable set of allo parents or attachments, a set of community members who are there to be responsive uh, and support mother and support child. And we know that mothers need to feel that support in order to care well for their children. In our ancestral context, there's three caregivers, two at least, three adults to one baby. And we know from contemporary research, three people in love with a child is going to foster their well-being. 
So children do best in societies where child rearing is considered too important to be left entirely to parents. Responsive relationships, number four. This means in babyhood you have reciprocal communication back and forth, mutual influence. The baby needs to be regulated, co-regulated by the nurturers, not regulate themselves. And they have to learn to synchronize and repair when things get dissynchrony. Uh, so the child learns from the caregivers how to repair getting back in tune with others. And together with multiple nurturers, you build different stories, different ways of being. So with this person, you know, they like to wiggle a lot and dance, okay. And this person likes to just cuddle. And the baby learns lots of different ways to be with different people who smell different, who move differently. And so in each case, the baby's needs are met in the moment. And it's going to then wire the brain and body with optimal emotional, emotional regulation and various habitual patterns of getting along. And we know that responsiveness is related to all child outcomes, positive child outcomes. But for all of us, we need mentors throughout life. We need elders, the wise elders who tell us, you know, stories, encourage us, and give us insights into what we're learning today. Number five, positive touch. We all need touch, but babies especially need touch to grow in those early days, months, and years. And movement helps the child. The child expects, the baby expects to be carried around in lots of movement and lots of variety of scenery and interactions with different people. Otherwise, they get bored, right? Uh, and the movement helps digestion, helps brain development. The touching, the constant touch, being in arms, promotes healthy sleep cycles. It helps the baby feel confident to explore. It builds the social and cognitive capacities and promotes calmness. So there's a lasting prevention of excessive stress, of even memory dysfunction, and of depression. And we find in our studies that at age four months, the, the more touch a child has, several years later predicts fewer behavior problems. And maintaining touch, high touch, after babyhood also prevents behavior problems. Important to point out, no negative touch. That means no spanking, no pinching, no slapping, because we know we have the research to show that there are long-term negative effects. The child will have, uh, the, the individual will have less empathy, be more aggressive, and we find now that spanking is the equivalent, has the equivalent effect to physical and emotional abuse. Number six, breastfeeding. Ah, oh, breast milk is just so magical, so unbelievable. Mother has a science laboratory in her body to create the milk that child needs. It changes by time of day, more energizing in the morning and more calming at night. It's different for boys than for girls. Uh, it provides the nutrition needed when there is a growth spurt. It's 80% alive, uh, so it's feeding the good bacteria, the good things for your microbiome and your gut, where most of the immune system is. It's antimicrobial too, so it keeps out or controls the more negative bacteria and protects uh, the gut with a biofilm uh, at first until some other food is uh, consumed, and then that Biofilm is broken and uh, infectious agents can get through. So you want to breastfeed alone for as long as possible. It's analgesic, it um, is a painkiller. 
And it affects the jaw, it shapes the jaw and palate, the breastfeeding action itself. And we have a lot of problems now with sleep and tooth problems when you don't breastfeed. Uh, it's a problem throughout life. And mil our milk is thin, not thick, so it has to be ingested frequently, and that's why you carry the baby around. The baby gets to decide when they uh, want to have some milk. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's really vital for optimal development in all sorts of ways. Number seven, free play with others, social play. Uh, this means you get to choose how to play, run around, climb trees, wrestle. It's going to foster brain development in all sorts of ways, emotion regulation. You have to control your aggression because if, if you don't, your playmate will stop playing with you. You can see it when kittens, cats, kittens and puppies play. One of them will go, ah! And if the other partner doesn't change their behavior, that one will, so they'll stop playing, right? So you have to adjust yourself to what's happening with your playmate. You have to learn how to uh, react to unexpected play moves by your playmate. All really good for executive function development. It helps you take risks that aren't too great. Um, really needed in early life for developing your confidence and your executive functions and creativity is fostered as well. We have nature immersion then as number eight, attachment to nature, to feel that you are part of earth, that this is your home, and this tree that you love is your friend, right? Your partner, your kin, and this waterway, and this mountain, so that you feel that they are part of your community. When you have nature immersion, it's going to foster receptive intelligence, your ability to pay attention to their well-being, and you're going to feel care in people who care for the entities, the earth entities are going to be cautious about harming them. And we know that you can provide guided experience in classes with students that promote their insight into the well-being of the plants and uh, the animals in their area. And we know that if you just watch, you know, you go outside and, and see the trees or the mountains, that it decreases your stress, right? So very healthy. Finally, the last one, and we could probably add more components, but these are the ones we've looked at in my laboratory. The last one is regular relational healing, a restorative practices that you have in the community. Ideally, you are with your, um, your mates, your family, your neighborhood, and you come together and you celebrate things together, you grieve together, you heal together, uh, and there's various ways to do that. So it would be healing your relationships, healing your body, your mind, and promoting bonding with the community and with the nat natural world.